All right, we're going to record a little video here to walk us through the weekend homework solutions. Um, got a gravity problem from Independence Day where the alien spaceship starts pulling things off of the ground with its gravitational power. And then we've got a couple Coulomb's Law and a triangle problem to go through as well. So here is the first problem. We've got an alien spacecraft using gravity to pull objects off of the surface of the Earth. So this slide just sets up the whole problem. We've got a lot of information here. So long story short, um, we have the mass and size of the Earth in kilometers there for the for the radius, the size of the Earth. So that's um, going to have to be changed. We know our gravitational constant g. We know how far away the spaceship is from the surface of the Earth when it starts pulling things off. And that's a number I made up. I'm not going to lie. I just took a look at the video and estimated it. It's honestly probably too low. Should have been more like 250 or 300, but whatever. We'll go with 155. Um, and then it gives us some hints, right? So we know our we know gravity, the equation for gravity. Um, and then we've got our free body diagram over here. So let's take a look at that. Let's take a look at that. So basically, to overcome gravity, the gravitational attraction of the spaceship upwards, gravitational attraction of the spaceship upwards has to equal the gravitational attraction of the Earth downwards for whatever object is being lifted up. So let's say a car or whatever. So we've got a car on the, the surface of the Earth, and the gravity of the spaceship, um, the gravity of that you know, spaceship right here, is going to have to equal and overcome the gravity of the Earth. So when those two forces are equal, things are then able to start floating upwards. Um, the gravitational attraction of the ship would have to be like minusculely larger, but basically they're equal. Once they're equal, there's nothing necessarily holding anyone down anymore, and then a little toe tap on the ground would, would then send an object upwards with that, you know, Newton's third law of force pushing it back upwards. So, yeah, long story short, once these two gravitational forces are equal, then we can, um, then objects start floating. So we need to set those two forces equal to each other in order to figure out how large is this spaceship. That's our goal. How large is this spaceship? So let's um, let's figure it out. So I just I copied over the information we really need. We've got our numbers. We've got our goal. Remember, never forget your goal is right here. Solve for the mass of the ship. We've got the equations we need. We've got our free body diet. So let's just start solving it. And my, you know, you guys know my writing skills aren't the best here, so it's going to be a little sloppy, and I apologize. Uh, writing with the mouse, but F G of the Earth has to equal F G from the ship. So uh, F G from the Earth, we've got G. Well, I'm not going to write it all up here with my crummy handwriting, but we've got FG of the Earth. That's not an arrow. Come on. It's getting all sticky here. Let's try it this way. Try it this way. All right. FG of the Earth, right there. FG of the ship, right there. So, those two things are equal to each other. So, you can see that on both sides. Wow, that's. So bad. Hold on. You can see on both sides that G cancels out because we can just divide divide both sides by G. So remember, in algebra, when you do something to one side of the equation, you do it to the other side of the equation. So we're going to go ahead and divide both sides by G, and that just gets rid of the G on both sides. So now we're just left with M Earth times M object over the radius of the Earth squared on the left. And on the right, we've got M ship times m object divided by the distance to the ship squared. So we can cancel out m object as well. So what would happen if we divided both sides of that equation by the mass of the object? The mass of the object would simply cancel out. 
So anytime you have two things on the two equations, or sorry, anytime you have an equation with two values, um, you know, two things set equal to each other, that's what an equation is, and both sides of that equation have, you know, the same values, then you can cancel those values out. So that's what we did with G, the gravitational constant. It's in both equations, so we just cancel it right out. We don't even need G for this, which is nice. It saves us a lot of numbers. And mass of the object, we don't need, which is nice because we don't know it, right? I didn't even tell you what that object was. I said, how large does a ship need to be to start pulling anything off the surface of the Earth? We don't need to know what those things are. The mass of the object doesn't matter. It cancels out. So we've got our our final equation here, we've got mass of the Earth divided by radius of the Earth squared. And we've got on the other side now mass of the ship, which is our goal, over distance to the ship. Wow, come on, mouse, do better than that. Distance to the ship squared. And remember, I'm doing all of this with a mouse with my right hand. I'm left-handed, so I apologize for the sloppiness. And we want to solve this right here. We want to solve for the mass of the ship. But we know, fortunately, let's circle, I'm going to circle in green the things we know. We know mass of the Earth. Scientists have known that for quite a while. We know radius of the Earth. Um, We've known that for a long, long time as well, well before we launched into space. Um, launching out into space and, and taking those pictures and stuff, we're able to confirm our measurements of the radius of the Earth. Um, but actually, due to things, um, there have been a few different methods for measuring the radius of the Earth from the, from the ground with varying successes, but all of them pretty accurate. But now we have a very accurate number for that due to our ability to go into space and take some photos. Um, and of course, the distance to the ship we know because I told you. But we know everything we need to know except for the mass of the ship. So then we can do, 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 over here and solve for the mass of the ship. So that's what we want. We want the mass of the ship. So we need to get the mass of the ship by itself. That's the worst ever. Mass of the ship. And so we need to get the mass of the ship by itself. How do we do that? Well, we need to get rid of this r to the r s squared here. We need to move that to the other side. How do we get rid of, how do we undo a divided by? We multiply. So we need to multiply both sides by distance to the ship squared, and that will get mass of the ship by itself. So let's do that. So we got distance to the ship squared now on this side. We didn't have it before, but now we do. I kind of, sorry, so I mashed the ship on the left now. Sorry about that. And that's times the mass of the Earth. And it's still divided by the radius of the Earth squared. So boom, there's the answer right here. We just have to turn all of these variables into numbers here. So our ship we have 155 mass of the earth we have is big 5.97 times 10 to the 24 so that's 597 and 22 zeros <laughs> uh, so earth is heavy earth is the heaviest thing on the planet it is the planet so yeah that makes sense earth is very very heavy and distance to the center of the earth is here in kilometers so we're gonna have to change that to meters that's a simple multiplication by a thousand. Kilometers and meters are pretty easy. Change that to meters. We just multiply by a thousand. And boom, there's our, our Earth. So we've got 155 squared, right? Let's let's do a little fancy highlight. So let's let's make our ship blue. So 155 squared right there. We multiply that by mass of the Earth, which is huge, 5.97 times 10 to the 24 kilograms. So we're going to have a pretty large number here to start off with, right? Because 155 squared is reasonably large, right? Multiplied by itself. 5.97 times 10 to the 24 kilograms is also 
very, very large. Um, but then we can divide it by another pretty large number here in the bottom. Ah. Purple's a little too dark. I wish they gave me... Okay, a little little hiccup just happened. I hit the wrong button, and it, it prematurely cut off my slide. And one thing I don't like about these PowerPoint slides is you can't kind of pick up where you left off. You have to redo it. So I just made a new slide to continue where we left off. So sorry about that. So anyway, long story short, um, let's use uh, yellow, I guess. Yellow for radius of the Earth squared, boom, boom, boom. And there we go. So we have everything we need to solve for the mass of the ship. We've got um, we've got the radius of the ship, the distance to the ship in blue there, 155 meters. You got the mass of the Earth here in green, 5.97 times 10 to the 24 kilogram. And we've got the radius of the Earth here in yellow. Um, that would be 6,371,000 meters. And so we need to plug that into the calculator here. So um, it's another thing I can't really show you right now, unfortunately. So um, but we all know how to use calculators by now. So 155 squared is 24,025. Multiply that by 5.97. Um, Got to go a little scientific mode here. There's my scientific notation button. I don't have it, so let's just do it manually here. 5.97 times 10 to the 24. And that gives us a very large number. And then we divide all of that by 6371000 squared. And we get a very large number still, which makes sense, right? Like, I sincerely hope that doesn't surprise you that it's a very large number. It's going to take a massive, massive, like, moon-sized ship, right? Like, that's no moon, as they would say about the Death Star. Now I have to do it. I can't see the Death Star without doing this. Here's the Death Star. Not a very good Death Star, but that's okay. Blowing up the planet Alderaan. And here's the planet Alderaan. And the Death Star. Blowing it up. Okay, well, that was fun. Um, anyway, it doesn't matter at all. I just had to do that because you can't mention the Death Star without having the Death Star blowing up a planet. But basically, that's what we have here is a, a spaceship like the Death Star, the size of a small moon. Um, that's what it would require for it to have enough gravitational power to actually lift things off the surface of the Earth. Now, if you've seen the movie... It, it creates gravity using a gravity core, not not using mass. It uses sci-fi. It uses science fiction, something that's not real, where it can artificially turn gravity on and off using some sort of magical power button. Maybe they've harnessed the power of the graviton particle. Who knows? Um, but in, if you've watched the movie, it doesn't actually work like this. But we're going to say it does. That This ship is simply so massive. It has so much mass that it's pulling things off the surface of the Earth. And that number is... All right, I, I deliberately talked for a while to give you a chance to do the calculation on your calculator if you want to, but 3.53 times 10 to the 15. So a billion times smaller than the Earth still, right? The Earth is 10 to the 24. This is just 10 to the 15. So a billion times smaller than the Earth. So it's not like a planet-sized ship, but it's certainly a moon. Um, you know, a, a small moon starts to get into that. It's very, 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 very big. Um, 3.53 times 10 to the 15, what would that be? That would be um, about... Three thousand, three and a half thousand trillion. That's what that would be. Three and a half thousand trillion kilograms. Right there. And that's our answer. So the spaceship is three and a half thousand, a thousand trillion kilograms. Three point five three times ten to the fifteen kilograms. And that's the mass required for it to overcome Earth's gravity and start pulling things up. So very, very large spaceship, 
Um, the only way, again, I, I don't, I don't think you could create a spaceship like that on a planet unless you lived on a planet like Jupiter. You probably, what they probably did is they went and, and converted a small moon or very large asteroid, something like that, into a spaceship. That's all I could figure. So anyway, fun problem. Fun little problem there to see how could this spaceship start lifting things off the surface of the Earth. And if it were three and a half thousand trillion kilograms, it could actually start to do that. Okay, we're moving into Coulomb's Law now. And these problems are pretty tricky. And I'm sorry, you know, it, it stinks that we have to do these kind of on our own. I'm doing the best I can to help you with these videos and stuff, but physics is hard, and I've been really impressed with most of you guys getting through it, working through it. Those of you who have been working every day, contacting me, asking me for help, you seem to be doing a very good job. Um, there are some folks who aren't contacting me for help and aren't really doing it, and then in their daily check-in surveys, they'll say, this is hard and I'll message you and be like, how can I help? And you'll be like, it's fine. I'm doing okay. And, and obviously you're not doing okay, but I don't really know how to help somebody who says they don't need help. I, I can't force you, especially from my house. If you're not going to ask for help or take help when I offer it, um, then I just have to believe that you're doing okay. And I really hope you are, but some folks, you know, keep saying you're doing okay, but you're not turning in any homework. Um, I don't really understand that, but that's a decision you make right now. When you're doing school from your house, you make your own choices. I can't make them for you. And if you choose to make choices that lead to failing, um, I, I feel bad, but I can't do anything about it. You've got to ask for help. You've got to be in contact with me. Um, people have done video chats where I've walked them through things kind of like this. I can share my screen and I can type things into Microsoft Word that that kind of show you how to do stuff. I've got lots of ways to help you here still. Um, but the key is you have to want it, right? I can't walk over to your desk and force you to listen to me anymore. So if you're okay with not understanding things, I guess that's your choice. But I would recommend you please ask for help, guys. Um, so anyway, here we go. Coulomb's Law in a Triangle. Let's... Let's take a little zoomed in look of what we got going on here. We've got three charges, right? So Coulomb's law is all about what we call static electricity. We're not, we don't have like currents. We're not doing circuits turning on light bulbs and stuff like that. Um, that would happen in physics too, should I ever get a physics too. Right now we're talking about electrical particles, things like electrons, protons, um, metal objects that have acquired electrons and protons. Things like that. So we're talking positive and negative electrical charges here. And it works very similar to gravity in the sense that you have a field force, right? These objects aren't touching each other. They're sending out a force field, kind of like gravity does. And any other charge in that force field is going to feel some sort of force. So we have three charges. Q1 with a positive 10 microcoulombs. Q2 with a negative 10 microcoulombs and Q3 with a negative 25 microcoulombs. And remember, like it says right up here, sorry about that, like it says right up here at the top, a microcoulomb is one millionth of a coulomb. So there are a million microcoulombs in a coulomb. It's 10 to the negative six. 10 to the negative six is what micro means. That looks really bad up there, but that's okay. Let's just remember it. 10 to the minus 6. And you can see that, right? Six zeros right here. The goal is to figure out how much force is on Q3. So Q3 right here is the star of the show. That's good enough. Q3 is the star of the show. It's got two other charges acting on it. Q1 and Q2 are both acting on this Q3 here when we need to figure out how much force are they a putting on Q3? So to do, let's get rid of all of this junk I've drawn here. And let's give ourselves some room to solve the problem. So Q3 is the star of the show. Let's start with a free body diagram, right? It's a forces problem. What do we always do with the force problem? This is Q3. 
What do we always do with a forces problem? We start with a free body diagram. So I just drew a little circle here. It says Q3. Trust me, that's what it says. I know the mouse doesn't look like it. Let's look at Q1 first. Q1 and Q3. What would those two things be doing to each other? So Q1 is positive. Q3 is negative. What do opposites do? Opposites attract. Opposites attract. So we want to look at what direction is this force going? We've got a positive and a negative, so we know they're going towards each other. So Q1 is pulling Q3 towards it. On our free body diagram, we draw force from Q1. We'll call that force on 3, if you watch the video. Force on 3 by 1. So force 31 means force on object 3 from object 1. You'll see that a lot in college. So we'll start using that now. What other force do we have going on here? Well, we've got Q2. All right, so now we're looking at Q2 on Q3. What is Q2 doing? Q2 is negative. Q3 is also negative. Negatives, you know, you may know that if you're a negative person and you have another friend who's a negative person, it gets pretty toxic, right? There's too much negativity. So negatives repel, same charges repel. So a positive would push away a positive, a negative pushes away a negative. So, for, so Q2 is trying to push Q3 away like that. Force on object 3 from object 2 is pushing it away just like that. So now we have um, two forces at an angle. That's not helping us any. So let's draw our xy diagram, right? So Q, Q3, xy diagram. So let's look at force 3, 1, force from object 1, force from Q1. It's got an x component going to the left, um, F1. I'm just going to get rid of the 3 now because we know we're on object 3. So F1, x going to the left there. And F1 also has an upwards component, right? So this force right here. This force from object one is going up and to the left. So on our xy diagram, we'll need an F1x going to the left and an F1y going up. Same thing with F2. Let's look at F2 now. F2 is going up and to the right. So it's x direction portion, F2x is going to the right and f2y pretend that's straight up i'm sorry i'm not gonna erase the ocd here because this video is long enough already but f2y is going straight up so when we look at our xy diagram here we've got two x direction forces F1x going to the left, F2x going to the right. So they're kind of competing. They're pushing each other back and forth there. And we've got two y direction forces. Um, F2y and F1y going up. Um, Those are the four forces we're working with here. Well, two forces in reality, right? It's just two forces, but we split them up into four so that we can do X and Y. So let's look at the X direction first. X direction first. X direction says um, we've got a positive F2X and a negative F1X. So let's go ahead and call to the right positive and to the up and up. So there we go. To the right is positive and up is positive. This is our little arrow showing which ways are positive. So we've got a positive F2x and a negative F1x. And wouldn't it just be nice if those things canceled out exactly? Well, turns out they do. So let's look at what we're working with here. Charge 1 and charge 2 have the same strength. One is positive and one is negative, which is why one is pushing it and one is pulling it. 
right? So that explains the left versus the right, but their strengths are the same. Both of those charges have a strength of 10 microcoulombs. So that means they're going to have the exact same Coulomb force. So when we look at Coulomb's law here, right, F of electricity, and for whatever reason, Q means electricity in physics. So FQ equals K, which is 10 times 10 to the ninth, remember, K charge one. You can really use capital or lowercase Q. Q pretty much just means electrical charge in physics. So it's one of those rare times where it doesn't matter if it's capital or lowercase. And R means distance as usual. So there's our Coulomb's law equation. So Q, one of the Qs in both of these cases is gonna be Q3, right? So Q3 is, is one of the charges in, in both of these cases for F31 and F32 charge, Q3 is involved. However, the other Q involved, Q1 or Q2, either way, it's going to be 10, right? It's going to be 10 microcoulombs. So F31 and F32 are actually going to have the same strength because of that, because Q1 and Q2 have the same strength, same amount of electricity. One's positive and one's negative, but it's still the same strength. Because they both have the same strength, both of those forces are going to have the same strength. Also, because they have the same angle, both of those forces are going to have the same angle. So therefore, the x direction just cancels out to zero, right? Because same strength force at the same angle means F1x and F2x are going to be exactly the same. Just one is going to the left and one is going to the right, so they cancel out. So F1x and F2x, the two of them highlighted in blue here, cancel out to zero. You can say zero newtons if you want, because we're in a force. So the x direction force is simply zero. Pretty awesome. That makes it easy. Let's check out the y direction. That looks like an x. Y direction. So we've got F1, Y plus F2. Y equals our total force, our net force, remember, that's our technical term for total force. So net force Y, that looks a little bit like an X. Try that one more time. Net force Y. So net force Y is equal to our two Y forces added together. So let's figure out what one of those Y forces would be. So we've got our FQ equation here. So I hate having to write things twice with the mouse, but we're doing it. FQY simply equal to FQ, right? K, Q. Let's do, let's do F1Y. So Q1, Q3, because remember, Q3 is our other object here. So. Okay, Q1, Q3 over R squared. And what is that R? It's the distance between object one and object three. So that's our total um, force between object one and object three. We want the Y portion of it. How do we get the Y portion? Well, let's look at our triangle here, right? So F31 is an angle up and to the left like that. Here's, that's F, the force between object three and object one. It makes an angle, if you look at our free body diagram, up and to the left. So the X portion of it is right here. Do, do, do. Let's, let's, use some other color here. let's make X portion red, because we don't care about it. So here's our X portion, do to do, do. Again, pretend these are straight lines. And our Y portion can be green here. Here's the Y portion. Y portion is green. The Y's keep looking like X's. This is like, I don't want to be here if that's green. There is a Y. Okay. So, our Y portion and our angle that we care about is this one right here. That's the angle because this is, this is Q3 right here. 
So there's our angle. So our y portion, as you can see, is not touching our angle. It is opposite. Going back to Sokotoa, S-O-H, sine goes with opposite. So we know we need sine. Mul multiply this force by sine to make it the y direction. So now here's a good question. What is our angle? So we look right over here. And the diagram, the little picture I made for you there, shows you the angle is 31 degrees. So sine of 31 degrees. All right. So we get K, which is 10 times 10 to the 9th. I don't want to write all of these numbers in here, guys, because it's going to be... Well, I should. I should do a lot of conversions. Dang it. Okay, it's going to be sloppy. So listen, if you can't, if you can't read my writing with my mouse, please listen. So we've got K, which is 9. And this one's easy to remember because everything's 9. 9 times 10 to the 9. So double 9. 9 times 10 to the 9, that's just, that just means 9 billion. Times 10 to the 9 means billions. So we've got 9 billion. Oh, goodness. Time for the units everybody loves. Newtons times meters squared. Divided by Coulomb squared. So there's K. <laughs> Make these parentheses match. Uh, Q1 is 10 microcoulombs. So 10 times 10 to the negative 6 coulombs. Remember, micro means 10 to the negative 6. And Q3. 25 times 10 to the minus 6 coulombs. And the distance between these two charges is 0. Eight meters, and we want to square that. All right. Uh, and then I ran out of room. So let's move over to the let's left over here. Sorry about that. And sine. I'm gonna multiply all of that by the sine of thirty-one degrees. So all of this is multiplied by the sine of 31 degrees. And that'll get us the y portion of F1, right? The force from object one. So um, calculator time. Right? So I'm, I'm going to do this on my calculator. You guys try to follow along on your calculator or using Google. That's actually what I'm doing on my phone. It's, it's just good old fashioned Google calculator. So sine of 31 degrees is about one half, 0 0.515 for sine of 31 degrees there. Um, this is a kind of overwhelming Google even. Let me go to Wolfram Alpha. There we go. All right. Sine of 31 degrees times 9 times 10 to the 9th times 10 times 10 to the negative 6 times 25 times 10 to the negative 6. And then divided by 0.48 squared. Go. And let's see what we got here. First, that's why I like Wolfram Alpha. It shows me my equation to make sure that I indeed got everything how I want it, which is correct. 
and we get five newtons basically five point zero three newtons be careful because it feels like we just solved the problem but we did not that is simply f one y remember this is f one y is what we just solved for there's also f two y the great news about f two y is everything's the same right this for f two this is still the same your angle is still the same q three is still the same and the distance is still the same so it's wonderful f2 and f1 are going to be identical so because of that we can just take f1 and multiply it by two because there's two of them so that's wonderful we've got f1 we know f2 is exactly the same because all of the numbers are the same we don't have to do it again we can just take f1 and multiply it by two and that will give us the total force on q3 10.06 newtons that is our final answer right there that's the answer so again we started with the y direction or the x direction excuse me we started with the x direction and we learned that they cancel out that is it's zero because both force one and force two are the same because of that the x directions push and pull with the same amount of force they cancel out y direction had two the y direction here had two forces going up. We had to add those two forces together to find out the total upwards force. We found one of those forces right here, and then we realized that the other force would be identical to it because all the numbers are the same. So to find the total force right here, our final answer, 10.06 Newtons, we just took our one force and multiplied it by two. So hopefully that makes these problems make a little more sense, but basically you just gotta take it one thing at a time, right? One direction at a time. So either do X first or Y first, one direction at a time, and then one force at a time. So we started with force of object one right here. We found that object for first. And then we realized, and then we found object two. However, we realize that those two forces would be the same in this case. Not always true, right? If object two had a negative 15 microcoulombs, we would have had to punch in 15 for that one, and, and, and F1Y and F2Y would have been different. So it's, it's just because they happen to be the same, that's why we could just multiply it by two in this case. If those charges aren't the same, then you have to find each force individually and add them together. So really, it's the exact same as we've already been doing with angle forces, lawn mowers, and dragging a box, and things like that. Um, it's just now, instead of the force being from someone pushing or pulling, it's now electricity making the force. But once you get to this point right here, once you have your free body diagram, it's same old, same old, right? We just need to, okay, we've got our forces. Let's split them into X and Y, and let's add them together. Now, how do we add them together in this case is with Coulomb's law. That's how we found how, how large these forces are. But in the end, it's all the same. We take, um, now we take the forces involved and we add them together to find the total force. And that's what we'll be doing for, well, the rest of this week. And then I'm hoping next week we can move into energy. Um, we're starting to run out of time here and I, and I want to get through energy and torque would be a kind of a miracle if we could get through the whole semester still but we're still on pace and i want to do it so yeah that's it long story short free body diagram split it into x and y find your x find one of the directions for first in this case we did x and find your other direction and then add all of your forces together to get your total force just like we've been doing for the last few weeks now all the way back since before spring break now we're just uh now one the forces can be electrical or we had force normal and force push and for force pull and force friction and force gravity and now we're adding electric forces into the mix and that's the only difference all right this problem's kind of tough let's zoom in and take a look at what we've got we've got going on here so now again three charges in a triangle 
but our triangle is now a, a right triangle. Right? It's got a 90 degree angle in there. We had sort of a, an isosceles triangle in the last problem. Now we've got a right triangle here in this problem. So uh, we've got Q2 this time. Q2 is the star of the show here. This is the four, This is the charge that we're looking at. So when we make our free body diagram, it's going to be for Q2. So why don't we just start that now? To do free body diagram. Actually, I forgot. There's something that pops up in that corner that we'll need later. So we'll get to that later. But Q2 is our star of the show for this problem. Uh, it's got negative 32 microcoulombs. Q1 has a positive 20 microcoulombs. Q3 has a positive 15 microcoulombs. The goal is to find the strength of the net force, the total force on Q2. Um, we don't need the direction. The direction gets a little more complicated. Um, you can actually find the angle using the inverse sine or the inverse cosine like we did before, but don't worry about that. If you want to challenge yourself, you can do that. Send me the answer. Um, maybe I'll give you a, a couple bonus points or something. That'd be fun. So anyway, that's what we're working with here is we're trying to find force on Q2. And that Pythagorean's theorem might be helpful later. So I'll add that in there as well. That's all the stuff, all the important information we need. So free body diagram. Let's we'll start with that. Do to do on Q2. What forces are acting on Q2? Let's look at Q1 first. Q1 is positive. Q2 is negative. So they're going to attract. So Q1 is going to be trying to pull Q2 straight on up like that. Um, Q3 is also positive, so Q3 is going to be trying to pull Q2 towards it, like that. So this is force from Q3. This is force from Q1. Oh, I love when it works out like this. It's already an XY diagram. We don't have to do any crazy sines or cosines today. It's already an XY diagram. How lovely. Oh, that's great. So, because it's already an XY diagram, um, we can just move right into the math, right? We've got our Y direction forces, in this case, just one force, F1, that's our entire Y direction, and our entire X direction is F3. So, um, it's already split up for us. We don't have to split it up. That's so lovely. Um, so, that made things a little easier for us. So, now we just need to know what the net force is. And you can see that's where Pythagorean's theorem can be helpful. Um, you can actually do this without Pythagorean's theorem. Whoa, that's a little dark there. That rust colored. Um, there we go. Right there. So to find the total force, the total force on an object, you can do it using that formula there. So the total force squared is simply equal to the x force squared plus the y force squared. So if we find the x force and the y force, we can find the total force. So let's find the x force first. In the x direction, we've got um let's, force in the x direction is simply F3. That is our force in the x direction. So what is F3? F3 is K times Q3, right, Q, Q3, or you could do Q2 first, it really doesn't matter. Multiplication doesn't care about what order you go in. So Q3 is one of the objects with a charge. Q2 is the other object with a charge and the distance between them. I'm gonna ignore units this time because it's so annoying to write with a mouse. On the answer key, which I need to put together and send out to you guys today, I'm so sorry, I'm a little behind today but that's okay, we're, we're getting through it. So nine, 10 to the nine. I don't think I finished that thought. The answer key will have units. This one will not, cause mouse. Q3 is 15 micros. Q2 is 32 micros. And remember, positives and negatives 
only matter for directions. Once we have our direction, which we have right up here, going to the right, once we have our direction, we don't care about the pluses and minuses on the charges anymore. That pluses and positive and negative electricity, electrical charges only tell us direction. Once you have your direction, keep your positives and negatives to show positive and negative direction. This negative 32 right here, that only told us, right here's negative 32, that we only use that for direction. That's what told us it's going to the right instead of the left. Once we have our direction, once we've drawn our arrows, ignore the negative charges. At that point, we only care about numbers. The positives and negatives just give us the directions. And 0 0.4 centimeters squared. Ooh, 0 0.4 centimeters squared. I stuck a centimeters in there. That's tricky. So you have to divide by 100 to get it to meters. So 0 0.004. And these things are actually pretty close together. They're only 4 millimeters apart. And we can plug that into our calculator. Back to Wolfram Alpha, thank you very much. And we've got 9 times 10 to the 9 times 15 times 10 to the minus 6 times 32 times 10 to the minus 6 divided by 0 0.004 squared. Big time force, big time force going on right now. Remember, electricity is a pretty powerful force, right? 10 to the positive 9 up here in our constant, as opposed to gravity with a 10 to the minus 11. Gravity is a weak force um, until you get something as large as like a black hole, right? Then, then gravity becomes very, very, very strong, but you need a lot of size before that happens. Electricity really doesn't need a lot of size to be a pretty strong force. And as we just found out, this force is uh, 270,000. 270,000 newtons is our x direction force. So now let's find our y direction force the same way. Fy is simply going to equal F2 or F1, excuse me, F1, force from object one, that's the only force in the y direction. Um, you have the same equation here. So I'm not gonna draw it again, because it's a pain in the butt. The only difference is instead of Q3, you have Q1. So we turn our 15, let me highlight that, thanks. We turn our 15 into a 20. That's the only difference is Q3 was 15, Q, Q1 is 20. That's the only difference. Oh, and of course, um, the, di the distance is different as well. That would be 0 0.003. Um, and that's really the, uh, the only couple dis differences there. So I'm, I'm not going to, uh, sorry. I had a phone call right there. I had to silence it. I'm not going to rewrite everything just for those two numbers being different with my mouse. On the answer key, I definitely will, because I'm just writing with a pen, so much easier. Writing with my mouse is a pain in the butt. So I'm not going to rewrite all of that. Just know it's the exact same equation, except we're using um, Q1's numbers instead of Q3's numbers. So that 15 becomes a 20. That 0 0.004 becomes 0 0.003. And let's see what our answer is. Punched in the wrong number. Trying it again. Uh, 640,000, so even bigger, which makes sense, right? Bigger charge, shorter distance, so it should get, it should get bigger, and it does. That gives us 640. That's a four, I apologize. I'm, it's, I'm so tired of writing with a mouse, you guys. All right, 640,000 newtons. So we've got Fx, we've got X, Fy, Fx, do, 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 Fy, do, do, do. 
So now we use Pythagorean's theorem to find out f total. So f squared equals fx squared, so 240,000 squared plus Hundred and forty thousand squared. So let's square those and add them together really quickly. Two hundred forty thousand. It's going to be a very big number, FYI, right? We have two pretty large numbers already, and we're squaring them. So they're going to get very, very big, 640,000. That's a big number. <laughs> uh, 4.672. I'm going to do it in scientific notation so I don't have to draw a million zeros. 4.672 times 10 to the 11th. That's a lot of zeros. That's a uh, hundred billion there. Four point six seven two. So it'd be about four hundred and sixty-seven point two hundred um four hundred and sixty-seven point two billion newtons squared. Now to undo a square, because right, this is f squared here. We just want f. So to undo a square, you gotta take the square root. So take the square root of that to get your final answer. Square root. Uh, to make Google or Wolfram Alpha do a square root, you just type in SQRT and then parentheses, and it'll take the square root for you. Um, can't you give me a decimal approximation? Yeah, you can. Approximately 683520. Close enough. 68. Three, five, two, zero. Newton. So six hundred, and that is our final answer right here. Six hundred and eighty-three thousand five hundred and twenty newtons. I apologize. This two looks like kind of like well, fix the two at least. I'm, I'm okay if my numbers look sloppy, but not if they look wrong. There we go. 683,520 newtons. So again, Pythagorean's theorem is just x squared plus y squared equals total squared. So you found our x and we squared it. We found our y and we squared it. And then we added those together and then we took the square root of that. That's a root. And on a good note here. And that um, is the final answer. So the final answer right here, 683,520 newtons. We got that, we found, first we found our X force, then we found our Y force. Once we do that, we can um, use Pythagorean's theorem to find the total force. You can also use sine and cosine to find the total force. Um, you don't have to use Pythagorean's theorem, but I wanna teach you all of the tricks you can use with triangles to find these things. Um, heck, you could have even used like law of, of signs if you wanted to, for those of you who are far ahead in math and know what law of signs is. There are a lot of things you can do with triangles. That's why I love triangles. They're very versatile. They have a lot of stuff going on that is very useful. So love triangles. Um, sorry this took an hour, but I think it's valuable to see. Again, you'll have the answer keys today. I still need to put them together. I'm sorry. I had a rough weekend. Um, not really. I just had a lazy weekend. I'm not going to lie and make up excuses. I had a lazy weekend. Um, I've been working so hard from home here, and uh, this weekend I, I took it off. So I'm a little behind today, but I'll get those answer keys out to you shortly. I hope this video made sense. Get your answer key done today. I know it's being posted a little bit late, so if you end up doing it tomorrow, I'll just pretend you were up at 7.30 this morning and we're like, hey, where's my physics work? I guess I don't have any physics work today. Um, I'll take the blame for that. So anyway, get your exit ticket answered either today or tomorrow. Um, on Friday, I'm gonna go through and start making missing work 
missing instead of incomplete. So your grades are going to start dropping if you don't have this stuff turned in. Um, for those of you, I would say most of us actually, physics has been doing a very good job. So most of you guys, you won't see your grades drop because you are getting your work turned in. And that's great. But if you're not getting your work turned in, your grades will start dropping on Friday. So get everything turned in. You've got an exit ticket from today's video. Please ask me questions if you need help, guys. I, I can't stress that enough. I've got probably eight or nine physics students total out of both classes that really actually message me for help. Please message me for help, you guys. I'm actually getting pretty good at being able to teach this stuff from my house, but these videos are just one of my methods. I, I can help you a lot over chat, over video call as well. So if you need help, ask for it. I can't, I can't come to your desk and ask if you need help anymore, right? So you got to talk to me. Okay. I hope this video helped and have a good Monday.